tell you a few things about Karen. She's a graduate of the Rhode Island School of Design. She moved to Prague, Czech Republic, after going here in 1999 on a Fulbright scholarship to investigate Czech glass casting traditions. Since then, her work has evolved and grown in numerous directions, including casting in bronze, iron, and clay. In 2006, she traveled to Japan on a cultural exchange from the uh, NEA to study the kimono, and in the seven years that followed, she's investigated the kimono form in various media and as a cultural signifier. The exhibition Floating World, which you will see upstairs, has come out of, that, of her time there studying kimonos. Karen has received numerous awards and fellowships, including the James Renwick Alliance Master of Medium Award in 2015, the Virginia A. Group Foundation Award, the Lewis Comfort Tiffany Foundation Biennial Award, the Fulbright Scholarship, and she's currently the Specialty Glass Artist in Residence at the Corning Museum of Glass in New York. Karen's exhibition profile includes the Czech Museum of Fine Art in Prague, the Chrysler Museum of Art in Norfolk, Virginia, and the Museum of Glass in Tacoma, Washington, and numerous others. Karen's work in the permanent collection, it, 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 Karen's works are in the permanent collection of nearly 30 institutions worldwide, including the Smithsonian Museum of American Art, the Renwick Gallery, the Fine Arts Museums of San Francisco, the de Young, Crystal Bridges Museum, National Gallery of Australia, and the Hunter Museum of American Art. <laughs> the Hunter purchased for its permanent collection reclining dress impression with drapery in 2006, excuse me, eight. Interestingly, the Smithsonian American Art Museum has the very same sculpture, but we got it first. <laughs> Just saying. Our sculpture has been on view for nearly 10 years here and only went off view for a very short period of time, but none of you caught so much flack for taking it down, we had to put it right back. It is truly one of the most popular exhibits in, in, uh, works in our collection. Karen's gonna share with us tonight video demonstrations of her artistic progress before taking questions about her work. I am fascinated by the way the human body is both personal and universal. As my body, it is specific, imperfect. But as the body, it is an object, part of a cultural ideal. For 10 years, I worked with the female nude as a timeless symbol of beauty. I contrasted the fragile, absent figure with an opulent cast dress to explore the tension between private and public space exposing the personal layer under these sumptuous expressions of culture. As I made these sculptures, I became aware that my visual vocabulary was myopic, wholly informed by Western aesthetics and ideals. I became captivated with the idea that at their core, clothing and bodies are neutral, without inherent meaning, and if viewed through a different cultural lens, they would appear completely differently. I decided to test my theory by going to Japan. After working with the rich drapery of Western dress, the kimono appeared austere. It fascinated me as the anti-dress. In 2007, I began a seven-month research fellowship through the Japan-US Friendship Commission. I lived in Kyoto, in the traditional kimono-making district of Nishijin, which hummed with the sound of kimono production. I studied all aspects of the craft, and I loved it from dyeing the silk to weaving the fabric and drawing the imagery. It was a completely amazing experience. I was taken under the wings of people devoted to traditional methods. I immersed myself in the culture of the kimono, which involved, among other things, joining my new friends on Friday nights for lessons washed down with glass after glass of shochu. In all cultures, clothing is an unspoken language, but the kimono is perhaps the most codified. Every element of its design, the imagery, the sleeve length, the obi type, and the way it's tied is highly significant. Putting on a kimono is assuming a role in society, a role proclaimed by the language of the kimono. In place of the West's preoccupation with the self, the Japanese idea of beauty is focused on the idea of a greater group. When a woman puts on a kimono, she must create a cylinder, the ideal shape to display the imagery. 
Her defining curves are eliminated through padding and binding. Her specific body is irrelevant. The beauty of the clothing supersedes the beauty of its wearer. Once I was back in my studio, I grappled with the concept of non-individual beauty. Instead of the absent body I had worked with in the past, I was now faced with one which had been erased, incorporated into a greater group, a body more significant than any single individual. Eventually, I found insight in Mu, the Buddhist notion of emptiness. Mu is not a variant of the Western nihilistic nothingness. Instead, it is the empty sky which contains the universe. With this in mind, I started working with biometric data from NASA and fabricated a precise mannequin of the median 40-year-old woman, an average every woman or an exact no woman, a female representation of Mu. As I started dressing my every woman, I realized more than ever how fluent I was in the Western vernacular of opulence and drapes, and how the Japanese expression of beauty was the radical departure I had hoped for. It was extremely challenging. I began to work in a spare and minimalistic way. I became more attentive to materials. Thinking of the kimono as a vessel for an erased body, I worked with clay for its humility, bronze for its tradition, rust for its transience, and glass because it embodies the contradiction of presence and absence. I found that my thinking parallels the aesthetic philosophy wabi-sabi, which is centered on the celebration of impermanence and prizes imperfection, asymmetry, simplicity, and the marks of time. I found particular kinship in kintsugi, where broken objects are repaired with gold, leaving scars visible and highly valued. From the beginning, I worked with kintsugi by intentionally drying ceramic in a way that caused cracks. Once, a kiln error caused the temperature to skyrocket, and three sculptures inside exploded. It was an opportunity for an extreme repair. I gathered all the pieces of unglazed terracotta and spent months putting them back together. I spent a total of eight years building the whole body of work I call Floating World. It is a translation of Yukio, the name of the pleasure quarters in Edo, Japan, filled with geisha, meiko, and kabuki actors, floating above mundane existence. It is a world that was made famous by the Yukio-e woodblock prints. It is these images of exotic beauty which influenced the 19th century avant-garde in Europe and the United States and gave birth to Japanese. But what intrigued me most was the Japanese homophone for Yukio, meaning sorrowful world. This is the earthly plane of death and rebirth from which Buddhists seek release. Even the name of the pleasure quarters, where people go to forget everyday worries and indulge in bodily gratification, uses a language that tempers beauty with an awareness of impermanence. For almost 20 years, I have focused on the expression of iconic female beauty in fashion and figurative sculpture. I enjoy exploring the cultural transformation of the nude through dress. In 2009, I became focused on night, and I began to think about the human body in a much larger and more abstract context. I wanted to look at how we interpret the infinite space that surrounds us, how we place ourselves in it and try to find relevance in a largely indifferent universe. In the fields of science and art, I studied how we imprint the human figure on the infinite, thereby translating it into a language we can understand. Nyx, the goddess of night, and all of the constellations that we have mapped over time attempt to anthropomorphize the infinite. I became interested in making female figurations of night. I titled sculptures Nocturnes, and like the musical compositions of Chopin and John Fields, after which they are titled, I focused on atmosphere over narrative. I studied the biological science of night, as well as astronomy. For the first time, I used color in my glass sculptures. I worked with German scientists to create a color and density that would create penumbral garments. 
I wanted my nocturnal females to rise from a darkened pool, simultaneously emerging from and merging with the night. I sewed the garments myself, choosing fabrics for their texture or how they folded and draped. In my mind, connecting the textures and drapes of fabric with the qualities of light and atmosphere at nightfall. I wanted to wrap the female figure in dusk, exploring both beauty and darkness. I used dressmaker's mannequins to develop my designs. I enjoyed engaging with the lost art of couture and studied designers from all time periods. One of my great discoveries was the Théâtre de la Mode. At the end of World War II, while Paris was in ruins, celebrated artists in the fields of ballet, theater, and haute couture worked together to create a series of fashion figurines that were displayed on theater sets created by contemporary artists like Jean Cocteau. The small scale of the work with its large intention and effect mesmerized me. It was a declaration of the importance of beauty and culture I titled my works Etudes in keeping with the musical nomenclature, but they are much more than studies for larger works. They celebrate the power of optimism and beauty. I became inspired to install the life-size sculptures in empty theaters, weaving together fashion, theater, and art, as the French project had. I was finally able to do this in the winter of 2016. We worked furiously to install and light the pieces in a very limited window between performances at the Historic Estates Theatre in Prague. Unpacking my nocturnes in a theatre where Mozart himself performed was a surreal experience, and we were all struck silent when we cleaned up the packing material and saw the moment we had created. I did a second installation at the Litomyshal Castle, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, that has one of the last five Baroque castle theaters in Europe. It is the only one with complete sets of painted stage designs. The installations remind me of tableau vivants of the 1800s, a particular form of performance art. Actors are both costumed and nude. They sit completely still. They create a living picture, like this one from 1857. At that time, it was illegal to move if you were nude, but fine to be nude if you were still. My installations are abandoned tableau vivants, Clothing has taken on the forbidden sensuality of the body. Fabric has become flesh. I feel a resonance between the emptiness of the dresses, the empty theaters, and the empty darkness of night. The theaters are antique remnants of the past, which are assiduously preserved as artifacts. Working on their stages reminded me of the uncanny stillness we experience at night, walking in a city devoid of any sign of life like a set waiting for its players. So I've been busy since I was last here. It's a little um, crazy to see all of that work. Um, so I thought I would share with you an experience that sort of inspired part of my thinking. When I first went to Japan, the very first day I was there, I went in Tokyo to a um, department store. And I picked up this lumpy, sort of oddly shaped object that was glazed in kind of a crooked and haphazard way. And I just flipped it over and I looked at the price tag. And it said 180,000 yen. So I'll depend on the people from the bank to translate that into dollars, but I think it's something like $18,000 plus or minus. And I thought, how is that possible that this thing that looks like I, or perhaps somebody much younger than myself, um, could have made, you know, how could it be so valuable? And it was sort of my bing bling moment when I realized that how cultures value things is completely different. And what one culture considers extraordinary and beautiful might not look that way to somebody in another culture. So that sort of really set the stage for my investigations into the kimono and opened my mind to the materials, like this broader mater material vocabulary and 
the very detailed ways in which they're used in different cultures. So when you go upstairs, be sure to take a look. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the materials there. Um, when I started the kimonos, the first ones I made were in clay. And um, many of the clay pieces I chose not to glaze at all. They're just the raw ceramic. Um, because there's something uh, in Japan about the idea of the nobility of materials simply as they are and allowing them to take their course. So the rust pieces, the iron castings are allowed to rust. The, the ceramic pieces actually are allowed to tear as they're drying and then I would repair them with gold. Um, and so that's just sort of a little, you know, as you're walking around, if you want to orient yourself towards the materials, there's that's that's sort of a great entry point into thinking about different cultures. And then my challenge to myself was to use those material vocabularies to talk about the notions of beauty and sort of. Now in the exhibit, we're able to look at two very different ideas about what is beautiful, a Western one and an Eastern one. So that's my spiel. Um, <laughs> and now um, there must be questions. So I would love to take like three or five questions and then we can scurry up to the exhibition and you should feel free to approach me and ask me anything you would like. Yes. You are so prolific. How long does it take you to make a single sculpture? Mm. I never make a single sculpture. Um, I'm always working on many things at once. So the the time that is unpredictable is when I'm clothing the figure. So sometimes that can take, you know, if I'm sort of in my groove, that can take a month, or if I'm distracted and not really in the flow of things, it could take three months. And sometimes I get frustrated and I just walk away from a piece, work on something else, and then return to it. Um, so that sort of internal studio can take, you know, three to six months, and then processing through the materials. All the materials present different troubles, technically. Um, Glass is very temperamental, so from start to finish, just in terms of the casting process, is about a nine month technical endeavor. Uh, clay is more forgiving, those pieces probably about a month, and metal is the most sort of reliable of all of the materials. Um, that, those castings can take a couple of weeks, and the great thing about metal is if something goes wrong, you can weld it. Um, which is just an incredible thing. It's, it's so great. Um, so those are the, the various time ranges. Yes. Have you ever sustained any injuries in your work? Yes, I dropped a painting on my head on New Year's Day. And I have this, I was just looking in the mirror, I was like, I have a little short patch of hair that kind of hangs out like a fringe um, because I dropped a painting on my head and there was blood everywhere. It was like my first studio injury, and I was like, Steve, come help me. I've damaged myself. Um, <laughs> so Steve came running, you know, I'm a little dramatic, uh, and he was like, you're fine, you'll heal. And then I was like, no, I really, I need to go to the hospital. Finally, we decided to go to the hospital, and I got three stitches. <laughs> That's the only injury. <laughs> Yes. Ah, now um, I have a new obsession. So for, I was trying to think, like, how could I describe the transition from one body of work to another? For a long time, I really thought about the human body as a, a common we <coughs> all learn bodies. So it's a common experience, and I liked to make figurative work for that very reason. That I felt that everybody could relate to it on an intuitive level. So then I started, uh oh. Um, <laughs> um, can we turn it down? There we go. Um, so I started looking around at um, environment because that's another thing that we all experience. 
And here in Chattanooga, you have an incredible environment that's filled with clouds, which is one of the things I started studying. And um, I became a member of the Cloud Appreciation Society. And I'm actually an ambassador now, so I'm going to try and talk. I'm going to try and get some of you to sign up tonight. Um, but the the thing in studying clouds that really fascinated me was the weight. Um, so what you see happening in the background is I'm, or a robot is grabbing a marble, a, a cloud in marble. But the genesis of the cloud is the thing that's important. Um, I worked with a group of scientists from Caltech, um, and they are atmospheric scientists who are studying climate change. Um, and in studying climate change, they're focused on the clouds because that's what's filtering us, protecting us from the sun. Um, and the thing that I read that was my mind blower was that a cubic a cubic kilometer of a, a cumulus cloud can weigh up to 220 tons. That's crazy, right? But then it's not crazy if you really think about it because all of those little particles of water, when it actually rains, that's the water coming out of the cloud. And if you think about carrying a bucket of water, which I do a lot in the studio, it's heavy. So it, it makes sense once you think it through, but it's one of those facts that's just out there and it's like a fact of nature um, that's in an object that we all see all of the time, these clouds. Um, and so I thought, well, wouldn't it be great if this, the cloud, so the, the scientists at Caltech, I, I wrote to them on the internet and I said, you know, I want to make a cloud out of marble that has the same weight as the actual cloud. I wanted to make a weight equivalency between the marble and, and the and regular cloud. And so they said, well, this sounds like a great project. They got involved. They um, turned on their supercomputer. Um, and <laughs> they ran a, a software program that they had written that simulates weather. Um, and so my idea was that sort of in the same way that the kimonos and the dresses are always based on something real a real figure in a real dress, that the cloud would be as real as it could be. Um, so we created a file, um, a digital file. Oh, well, they created a square kilometer of weather. And then um, I sort of dove in and chose one cumulus cloud. And we translated it into another file that could actually run the computer. And together, we, we calculated the weight. Actually, they calculated the way. <laughs> I like using the we word when I talk about the work of the scientists. I asked them to calculate the way. <laughs> so, um, so the the weight, the would be equivalent weight of my cumulus cloud would make my cloud twelve feet high. Um, but I decided for my first giant marble sculpture to make it fifty percent scale, so it's only six feet tall. And that piece um, was exhibited last year at the Biennale in Venice. So that was exciting. And everybody touched it, which I think is a compliment. I thought, there it is. It's like, it looks so good that they just want to touch it, you know? So that's, that's the most recent project. Continued my Skype relationship with the scientists, and um, we're working on a couple of other projects. Um, so one of the files I just received before coming here was for something called stratocumulus, which is actually a cloud that is endangered and it's possible will become extinct. Um, and stratocumulus is very important because it is, uh, it's not so interesting looking, it's not as interesting looking as a cumulus cloud, but it um, is that gray blanket and it reflects much of the heat of the sun back up. So we don't want those to become extinct. More questions? Yes. Yes. Um, <coughs> and I think the question was, she thinks of me as primarily a glass artist. And um, <coughs> now working in all these different materials, you know, how did how did I manage it? Did I have to, how did I learn it? Um, so I basically sort of put myself, sorry, put myself into an 
environments where there was tremendous expertise already. Um, for the ceramics, I went to the Netherlands and I worked at a place called the Euro European Ceramic Work Center. Um, and you know, they in no way fabricated the work for me, but they sort of pointed me in the right direction. Um, and then in terms of the metal, um, there are fabrication foundries established. I use ones in Italy because Italy is great. <laughs> um, but they're in the United States as well. And as long as you can make the wax, which I really got good at in, in working with glass, as long as you can make a wax, you can really translate that into a variety of materials. And I think we can take one more question. Okay, one more question. Saving the best for last. Yes, yes. So um, there's some um, explanations about the thinking behind the two bodies of work in each room. And then in, at, well, the material use, like what I associate with the materials is well outlined. Um, and then the processes are generally between one and 5,000 years old. So um, <coughs> you could probably look on the internet. Yeah, yeah, lots of, basically, yeah. So almost all of the processes I use are, are a variation on the lost wax process. So a wax is made, a refractory molded on that, the wax is melted out, and then either the metal or the wax is melted in. Okay. All right, so feel free to ask me one more question. 